Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, and I'm glad you can join us today for a very special Women's History Month edition of the podcast. Uh, and our guest today is a frequent contributor to the magazine, um, especially to our museum report, which is a very popular section, but he graces our pages in the current issue with a feature story that's getting a lot of play. It is the story of the perseverance of Lieutenant Nash, a World War II Navy nurse who was imprisoned for the duration in the Philippines and kept her spirit up throughout and never stopped administering care to others, even while she herself was suffering the deprivations of being a prisoner of war of the Japanese. Here to tell us this amazing story is Bill Galvani. Bill, thank you for joining us. Now, it's my pleasure, Eric. Very glad to have a chance to talk with you today. Yeah. There's great. been a lot of um, really positive response to this story, and it's because it's such an uplifting human story. And you got onto this story in a very interesting way, which I particularly found compelling, where an object, a piece of the past, if you will, yes, inspires a whole, opens a whole vista of what happened back in the day. And that's how this came about, isn't it? So why don't you tell us about all that? Yeah, well, I am a museum person by training, Eric, although I did serve in the Navy, but a museum person by training and as such am especially attracted to the importance of objects as a way of understanding and interpreting history. And my museum uh, at the time was the Naval Undersea Museum in Keyport, Washington, and that is the Navy's official museum for undersea history, science and operations. It's uh, also an accredited museum by the American Alliance of Museums, I should add. So it's a very good museum. Anyway, we were planning in about 1997 to do an exhibit about women in the Navy and particularly Navy nurses. And, and this was just a very lucky circumstance, Eric. The Navy Nurse Corps Association maintained its collection of artifacts in a town not too far from us. Uh, town of Port Orchard. And so with, uh, with my curator, we went over to look at the artifacts there. And uh, among them was the very dress that Margaret Nash had worn for years while she was a prisoner of war uh, by the Jeff, uh, for the Japanese at uh, the Los Banos camp. And to see this artifact was really, was really impressive because if anybody thinks about their time uh, well, that the artifact has survived because if you think about the uniforms the people wore while they were in the Navy, with the exception of their dress uniforms, their everyday uniforms don't survive. They, they're, they're worn on duty. They then uh, become uh, clothes that you wear while mowing the lawn. And finally, they end up uh, as polish rags when you're washing, uh, washing and waxing your car. But this dress was amazing. And uh, there it was in the museum. And the thing, two things uh, particularly impressed me, Eric, uh, as a museum person. One was that there was a very visible white line running horizontally across it, where it was obvious that uh, it had been created by uh, when she had rubbed, uh, had been standing at her uh, medical carriage treating patients. So it was very representative of the suffering and the hard work she had done. The other thing was that there was a photograph of that. And uh, that's not often in the museum world that you can find both an artifact and a photograph of it. So I got interested in the story uh, as an ex uh, for the exhibit. And the more I delved into it, the more impressive it got. And as a result, uh, I learned quite a lot about her the other 10 Navy nurses uh, who were imprisoned with her and the whole uh, prison, uh, the internment, uh, uh, the internment ordeal suffered by these Navy nurses, as well as uh, thousands of civilians. Yes. Um, so from a compelling artifact that made you think therein hangs a tale, you unearth what is a remarkable tale of all. Uh, Grace under pressure, the absolutely unconquerable human spirit. Um, she went by Peggy Nash. She was yes. Lieutenant Margaret Nash, but everybody called her Peggy Nash. Yes, and she was from um, 
Pennsylvania, correct? Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I uh, didn't. Uh, I looked into her earlier career, and she was already a nurse at the time that she, uh, in effect, joined the Navy. And she went to nursing school in Wilkes-Barre. And uh, following uh, a flood on, in her town, her uncle suggested that she might want to join the Navy. And remember, this was uh, in the late 1930s when the economy was very difficult for a lot of people and uh, because of the Depression. So she joined the Navy and she wound up going to uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital. Uh, I'm sorry, Norfolk Naval Hospital in Portsmouth. Uh, it's always confusing. I should remember it because my daughter was born there. But uh, anyway. Like the Portsmouth Navy Yard, a.k.a. Norfolk Navy Yard. And we're That's, in it. Civil War, That's yeah. it. That's it. So uh, anyway, at that time, there was, as nearly as I can tell, not a formal process for becoming a Navy nurse, but you simply demonstrated by on-the-job training that you had the capability. And after six months of that kind of training, she was certified and uh, became, uh, became a regular Navy nurse and was assigned to various Naval hospitals. And she's at Cavite um, Navy Yard, eight miles outside of Manila when the bombs start falling, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the quarters at the, in the hospital where the uh, nurses lived was a three-story structure, but it was raised on stilts. And... Uh, in advance of the attack, which they were getting prepared for, there were lots of sandbags placed underneath uh, underneath the the building. And during the attack, the the nurses took shelter down there from the Japanese bombs. Um, there's another interesting aspect about the the attack, Eric, uh, uh, is that while while Peggy Nash was on Guam. She became uh, engaged to an ensign uh, in the U.S. Naval Reserve, who's the executive officer of the USS Penguin, which is a, a minesweeper there. And uh, at the same, almost at the same time that she was being, she and the other Navy nurses were being uh, bombed by the Japanese uh, in Cavite. The, the the Penguin was also being attacked by the Japanese in Guam. Uh, the ship was uh, badly damaged. The commanding officer was very was uh, there was had no op no other option except to scuttle it, and so he and uh, her fiance, uh, whose name was Vincent Edwin Wood, became prisoners of Japanese on the tenth of uh, on the tenth of December. Uh, a little bit before uh, Peggy Nash and the other nurses did. And he remained a prisoner of the Japanese until uh, uh, September 8th, 1945. Uh, there's mm -hmm. another, there's a sub story behind that too. But uh, yes, mm -hmm. it was a very dangerous time uh, for the Navy nurses, for Peggy Nash and the Navy nurses to be in Cavite. The city uh, in Manila was uh, in chaos with people, uh, the military, mo the Navy, moving patients back and forth, not knowing where they would be safe, looking for a place where they could treat them effectively. Yeah. Everybody was trying to get out of Manila in the Philippines mm -hmm. as, in, in that um, crisis moment. And, of course, sadly, a lot of people did not, including the nurses in question here. Um, they were, oddly enough, uh, well, it was, it, as we said, it was a chaotic time. They were, in effect, forgotten at the uh, the Santa Scholastica hospital, a school where they had set up uh, set up a hospital to take care of their patients. They were they were simply forgotten. Uh, you know, in the in retrospect, we look back now and we say, "Well, how could that happen?" But there was so much going on in Manila between uh, bonding, bombing, uh, chaos uh, that it becomes understandable. Mm. Oh, sure. If you want to talk about the fog of war, Manila in late 1941. Yes. Uh, yes. It's like the world's falling apart. And uh, that Japanese juggernaut just rolled over everything uh, before you can catch your breath. So, But sadly, there they were um, now, um, prisoners of the Japanese. And um, what is what was the internment camp they stayed at? Let's 
talk about that a little bit. Yeah, they were initially, yeah, they were in th three camps altogether. Initially, they were in Santa Scholastica, which was, uh, only, they were just there for a couple of months. Then they went into Santo Tomas University, which had been converted to an, again, into an internment camp. Uh, and that happened to a lot of universities, a lot of colleges and schools during World War II. It was a 45-acre establishment uh, in, in which the Japanese brought mostly uh, American internees, American citizens who were civilians. Uh, the third place, the, uh, it became crowded rather rapidly. The nurses volunteered to help there. Oddly enough, uh, they weren't required to. I thought this was kind of curious as I did some reading about it, but uh, there, were, there was a tremendous need for medical assistance there and they were glad to help out. Later on, the 11 nurses went to uh, Los Banos, which was a camp south, southeast of Manila that was uh, in a, a very primitive condition and uh, had a small population at first. But as the war continued, more and more people arrived there until there were probably almost 3,000 internees. They were very like way more than it was meant to hold. Yes, they were, and um, both of these camps were very difficult places to live where food was scarce. The, the prisoners often were expected to grow their own food. Uh, it was uh, very, very challenging. Well, anybody who's seen the footage of the liberation of the Philippines and when the pr prisoners that have been there throughout the war are finally sprung free, it's, um, it's quite a gruesome sight. Uh, you know, rib cages completely showing utter, <laughs> utter famished skinniness. And um, it's like, how is that person still alive? And the, the scarcity of the food was just sort of the most salient, the salient thing, but it was just tough going all around. But one of the things that really impressed me about uh, Lieutenant Nash and her um, sister nurses was that they ministered help not only to their fellow prisoners, mm -hmm. but to the Japanese themselves, their captors. Yes. They were essentially their medical help as well. And that to me is the most um, rising above everything aspect of this I can imagine. Yeah, they were really dedicated to helping other people. And I think that their sense of mission, their, their desire to help people no matter what their situation was one of the things that helped sustain them as people as, as proud individuals so that they could maintain their dignity, maintain their self, self, of sen, uh, sense of self-worth, even as they were going through tremendous drep, deprivation, starvation, disease, uh, disease conditions. Yeah. I would imagine that their captors very much valued them specifically as prisoners because of the extra thing they brought to the mix, which was the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> untethered. They were lucky to have them. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the things that Peggy Nash mentioned in her oral histories was that the Japanese did respect the nurses because they were so dedicated to their work and they worked all the time. And they that was a feature that showed the stuff that they were made of, that they were going to maintain themselves and their pride, no matter what the circumstances were, no matter how hungry or sick they got. Yeah, just talking about this with you gives me an extra insight into the story now that we, I think about it. Um, it's remarkable how she kept her spirits up. Yet perhaps this, like as you, as you posit, that's exactly what kept her spirits up, their spirits up, the nurses. The fact they had a sense of purpose, a daily sense of purpose, that kind of chop wood, carry water idea of just, I will focus on what my mission in life is, and that is to help other people, to be a healer. And maybe that's what kept their spirits up. If they hadn't been able to have that outlet to do that, uh, it would have just been misery without any kind of plus factor to it at all. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, uh, later on when Peggy Nash, after the, after the war, was asked what kept her going, she said, their sense of purpose, sense of humor, and her faith in God. Well, um, it's become a cliche to speak of the greatest generation, but there's so many millions of stories that came out of that war that never cease to amaze me, no matter how many of them I come across. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, our forebears in that generation were made of sterner stuff than we. I often come away from it thinking, and this is as great an example as I can think of that I've seen in a while. Um, it's hard to put yourself into a position of a confinement like that in a wartime situation as well. Uh, and they showed the, they bore the marks of it by the end of it all. Did they not first off, how did their liberation come about? And then we'll talk about how they were afterwards. Oh, sure. Well, you're absolutely right, Eric. They were severely tested in about the worst possible way that you can imagine at, uh, the there were nurses, uh, there were army nurses at the prison intern or at the internment camp in Santo Tomas in Manila, and they were rescued early, I believe, in December. But Manila was at that time had been captured by the United States uh, and Allied forces. But the camp where Peggy Nash and the other nurse and her uh, other nurses were uh, often called the uh, the sacred eleven, or sometimes the twelve anchors. Uh, uh, was behind Japanese lines, and the American intelligence organization determined that the Japanese were planning to execute mass execute all of the twenty three hundred people in the camp on February twenty third, and they worked out a very complicated and risky rescue plan uh, involving Filipino guerrillas, army infantry troops, and army paratroopers uh, to come in and save them. And it really was literally, literally in the nick of time. And so 7.30 on the morning of the 23rd of February, 1945, uh, Amtrak showed up to crash through the gates. Filipino guerrillas uh, overwhelmed the Japanese guard force and American paratroopers came down out of the sky to rescue the crew. Uh, that story is told, by the way, very well for those who are interested in it, in a book by uh, Bruce Henderson called Rescue at Las Banos. And I could recommend that for people who would like to know all the details about Rescue it. Rescue at Las Banos? Rescos, yeah, Rescue at Las Banos by Bruce Henderson, uh, published in 2015. Uh, however, a lot of the, the prisoners didn't understand what was going on and were in some way resistant to leaving the only home they'd known for three years. So it took quite a lot of effort to get them to walk about two miles to a place where they could be loaded onto Amtrak's to go to safety. And when they got to that beach, the Japanese were shooting at them. And Peggy Nash at that point was carrying a baby girl with her who was uh, about eight, eight days old. And, uh, was told by her senior nurse, uh, chief nurse, Laura Cobb, that she says, protect these babies no matter what you do. And Peggy was one of the two nurses carrying an a infant, a newborn with her. And when they got to the beach, uh, she was under fire and she threw herself down on the sand and she put herself on top of the baby. And then when she had an opportunity, she was told to sprint into an Amtrak, which she did. The Amtrak began to fill with water because they didn't close the doors quite possibly. She had to lift the baby up over her uh, head to keep it out of the water. Finally, the doors got closed. The Amtrak got underway. And in about an hour, they were across the bay and safely into American-held territory. But it was a, a very dangerous situation, a very harrowing, too, when you consider that, that she and all the other in nurses and the internees were starving. They didn't have any physical strength at this point. This really required a last gasp effort, mustering all the, the strength and courage they had. It was amazing. It really is. It, um, it's just a phenomenal story. And thank goodness they got out because it certainly sounds like they easily, just as easily could not have. Oh, well, you mentioned that they were starving and weakened thereby. Um, there's a photo in the article that illustrates this. Um, Lieutenant Nash was 78 pounds mm -hmm. when she was freed. 78 pounds. Yes. And yet in the photo of her back where they're, they're um, recuperating, um, she and another fellow nurse of hers are sitting there and they're trying to eat a piece of chocolate, each of yeah. them. And they haven't had much. that has to be like, manna from heaven, a little piece of chocolate. Yes. And they, they, she just looks so emaciatedly thin. And yet her spirits are still up. 
You know, she's yeah. smiling about it. She should just look like sunken cheeked and whatever, but she's she's all smiles in the photo. Oh, they were you're you're absolutely right, Eric. They were so gaunt at that time. She had lost so much of her body weight. She also had tuberculosis. She'd had beriberi. She'd had dengue fever. Her her feet, which you can't see in the photo, of course. Uh, she had jungle rot for then, and almost for the rest of her life. Uh, she was the, the the internment took a tremendous toll on her physically, as it did of all the people who were with her. Right. So it, it's no surprise that she was medically discharged in 1946, I believe it was. Yes. What yes. is surprising is she went on to live a fairly long and full life afterwards. It took her a year to recover in the Naval Hospital in St. Albans, New York. Uh, and she would afterwards, though, as you say, she did recover uh, and went to Calif back to Berkeley, California. When she had done some Navy training, she uh, before she went to the Philippines, uh, before I'm sorry, before she went to Guam and the Philippines, she was at Oak Knoll Hospital, and she liked the area so much that she went back uh, when she was finally uh, uh, discharged from the Navy. Right. Um, she went on to a career at uh, UCAL Berkeley, I think. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yes. She worked with student health services. She worked there uh, until she until retirement, and then she continued to live there. Then she passed. I believe she retired in 1981, and she passed away in 1992 and uh, chose to be buried at her home church in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Well, I think they're still very proud of her in Wilkes-Barre, uh, uh, oh, and I, I believe she got a um, her, heroine's oh. welcome at, after the war. Uh, I think they had a parade of like 25,000 people and all the fanfare. They did. They very did. Muster. Yeah. That had to be extremely gratifying. Yeah, there was a, there was a band. There was uh, a, a, a 50 card, uh, 50 car parade, uh, American flags. And uh, it's worth remembering, too, that she was a Bronze Star recipient twice, once from the Army, once from the Navy. And this did not happen often for women during World War II. It was a remarkable accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Well, it was certainly well-deserved. Um, it's kind of a, what a, what a different chapters of history her life encompasses. Just one life is one example of it, but you could come up with any, any people who straddled that generation in the decades of that generation. She's in a, um, a hell hole through World War II courageously and tenaciously survives that, keeps her spirits up the whole time. Later, she's a, a campus nurse at Berkeley uh -huh. all through the unrest of the late 60s and 70s. That must have just been like, she's in these different places at different times that are so very different from each other. I, I just wonder what go, what's going on in her head. You make a good point, Eric. Uh, and it would have been nice if she might have recorded some of her thoughts about what it was like to be in Sprawl Plaza and uh, Berkeley at the time, as you say, of the uh, the anti-military, anti-Vietnam uh, riots, protests of the the late uh, the mid and late sixties. That would be a very interesting thing to know. Um, and then it's nice she um, came home for her final rest in Wilkes-Barre, and um, that's a good kind of ending of the story, I think. But yeah. yes, uh, for. Uh, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, the, it's the Navy Nurse Association. I have that oh, correct. The Navy Nurse Corps uh, Association, uh, the National Navy Nurse Corps Association was a tremendous help to me in preparing this article because uh, even though I found the dress, her dress, while uh, I was in Keyport, it was in Port Orchard, the Navy Nurse Corps Association now and the, uh, the executive director is a very helpful lady named Mary Mahoney has transferred all those artifacts to a, a excellent storage facility in the Washington DC area to ensure that they will be preserved in perpetuity uh, so that people can understand not only Mary's story, uh, Margaret's story, but the story of uh, the Navy nurses who served before her and the ones who serve today. It's, it's such a um, frontline part of the war. <laughs> it often gets overlooked in all the, um, looking at the operational, what went on and all that, which we focus on, of course, but there's so many other elements to what's going on. It's such an all-encompassing thing as a world war. And um, people from all professions and walks of life um, get swept up into that. And some of them um, 
endure and abide and make the world a better place for mm -hmm. that. I think that Lieutenant oh. Nash is a wonderful example of that. Yeah, I'd also I like to be proud of her. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I'd also like to mention the uh, Military Women's Memorial, which is located in Arlington, Virginia, which holds uh, also a tremendous number of wonderful stories and artifacts about military women in general, not specifically Navy nurses, but it certainly does include them, but uh, all military women uh, from all the American Armed Services. And uh, it was there that I found the original uh, unedited transcript of Margaret Nash's oral history. And that was a, a big help to me in writing the article about her. Oh, yes. What a find. I mean, there you go. There's the mother load of the, um, the first hand, the first draft of history right there. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing better than when you un unearth something like that when you're working on it, is there? Well, the first, the, yeah, first person is always the best. Yeah, mm -hmm. to direct contact with the person who experienced something. Uh, Why don't you I, give um, the viewers a, a shout out for that book again you mentioned about the liberation of the camp? Because that sounds like a real corker of a read. I'm going to look for it myself. Yes, yeah, so well, I would like to like to mention a couple of books if I can, Eric. Uh, sure. And again, that was. Uh, that book is, um, here we go, uh, Rescue at Los Banos by Bruce Henderson. But for uh, other uh, people who are interested in what the life in that camp was like, the experiences of all the nurses, uh, Margaret Nash included, there are a couple of really excellent books uh, that I appreciated. One of them is called No Time for Fear. And uh, the Voices of American Military Nurses in World War II by Diane Burke Fessler. And that's a relatively recent book. Uh, and in fact, the title, No Time for Fear, is a direct quotation from Margaret Nash. Uh, oh, from my, her okay. History. Uh, and Margaret uh, and Peggy Nash said that uh, about the initial attack on um, uh, Cavite. She said, we were so busy treating patients and looking at the wounded and the dead. She said, there was no time for fear. Another excellent book is Pure Grit, How American World War II Nurses Survived Battle and Prison Camp in the Pacific. And that's by Mary Cronk Farrell, also a recent publication. Uh, and then two others, if I could mention them really quickly, because they- yeah, Sure. Sure. One is called We Band of Angels by Elizabeth M. Norman. Uh, and all this, all this hell by Eleven, Eleven, I'm sorry, Evelyn Monahan and Rosemary Nidal Greenlee. And I could rec recommend any of those four books to people who would like to know more about what the uh, the Sacred Eleven experienced while they were prisoners of the Japanese in Santo Tomas or Los Banos. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing those. And it's it's. I always like to say that uh, history is never finished. No. History is never all the way written, and it's exciting to see there's a new, an emerging body of literature on this aspect of the Second World War. Um, there's always some other um, dynamic there that has not been um, picked apart and done to death, and uh, that's what's always so exciting and uh, rewarding about this. Well, well, Bill, we look forward to more um, fascinating stories from you in the magazine. Uh, I hope we'll see you in our pages again very soon. And thank you so much for joining us for this. This has been an um, uplifting discussion, to say the least. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Uh, I always enjoy reading every issue of Naval History as soon as it hits my door. Why, thank you, sir. Okay, thank All you. Killer, no filler. That's our mantra. Okay. All right, well, take care. Thanks thank again, you. Bill. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. That's it for us for this time, folks. But please join us again next time for the next Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History, signing off until next time.